welcome. I am your host, Mary J. Bryant, and this is Faith in Action. I am so glad that you joined us on today. I hope you are enjoying Welcome Holy Spirit. Because you know, we can't do anything for God without His Holy Spirit. Amen, amen. Again, welcome to Faith in Action. The last time you saw me, we were talking about faith that produces humility. And it was a long segment, so I had to stop it. And I did not finish it. And I told you that I would be back to finish up that segment. So that's what I'm here before you to finish up. Faith produces humility. Amen. 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 Well, let's get started. Let us get started on that se that segment right now. And what I will do is I gave a, a working definition for humility. Let me take my glasses off right quick. And that definition that I gave on my last segment is living with the right understanding of who God is, who I am, or who you are, and who who I am and who you are. Humility is a fundamental part of the Christian faith. And your humility grows through encountering God and meditating on His Word. Pride makes faith impossible, but godly humility ultimately destroys pride. We have a, a part in this because we have to elevate ourselves. We have to evaluate ourselves. Excuse me. Let me give you a, f a few illustrations of the faith that causes or produces humility. Remember in Matthew chapter 15 verses 21 and 28, the Canaanite woman. This is the woman who comes to Jesus with a demon-possessed daughter and begs for her healing. Jesus essentially calls her a dog and says he will not help her. She responds with an amazing statement. She said, yes, Lord, but even the dogs feed on the crumbs which fall from their master's table. This woman had a low view of her own importance. It did not matter to her whether she was called a dog or not. She had no entitlement, but she also believed Jesus to be a good and gracious man. This is evident at her response that even the dogs feed on the crumbs. Essentially, she says to him, I know you have something to give me. I know who you are and that you are gracious. Consequently, Jesus praises her for her great faith and heals her daughter. Without faith in a good and gracious Jesus, this woman would have gone home after the first rebuke and conceded to live with her demon-possessed daughter and moan over her lowly place in society as a dog. It took humility. For this woman to stay there and continue to, 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 to plead with Jesus to help her daughter, she understood the place uh, where she was. She understood the place of Jesus himself, his position, and what he could do for her. That's the faith that produces humility. That I don't care how you look at my low estate, if you think I'm not worthy, it does not matter because I believe you have something to help me. And I don't mind knowing where I am and humbling myself 
by my faith because I know when I do that and I press in, I'll get the results that I am seeking. The next is the prodigal son. Now you remember the prodigal son, right? Luke 15, 11 through 32. To most of us, this is a very familiar story. This son who has sinned greatly against his father is preparing his speech as he returns home. He has no sense of entitlement to be called a son, but is simply hoping to be a household slave in his father's house. He has a low view of his importance. But he also believed his father, which as you know, his father is a rep representation of God. He also believed his father to be a good and gracious man. Without this belief, the son would not have made the journey home. Without faith, this son would have stayed in the far country eating pig food and living in poverty, mourning over his foolish decision to leave home. Amen. It's amazing that the son had to go away. First, he demanded of his father that he give him his inheritance. Normally, the inheritance are given after a person is dead. But he demanded this inheritance. His father was good and gracious and said, Okay, son, here is your inheritance. You go your way. And it took that. It took that. At first, it took him to believe that he was... He was entitled to an inheritance to come and ask his father or demand of his father to give it to him. But then it took, took him to go away with that inheritance, lose everything he had down to, to the fact that he was eating with the hogs. To understand now I am not important. I'm, I'm, look at me, I'm eating with the hogs. I had all this money. I had my inheritance. Now guess what? I, but I know my father. He is a good and gracious man. I will humble myself and I will go back home even if I have to be a slave because I know he has something that's going to meet the need that I have. Faith producing humility. You believe a thing and then you humble yourself to ask for a thing from the person who can give it to you. Then we have the tax collector. In Luke 8, the 18th, 18th chapter, 9 through uh, the 14th verses, in a parable found in Luke 18, Jesus described a tax collector who enters the temple and prays, God, be merciful to me, the sinner. He had a low view of his own importance, but he also believed God to be good and gracious. Otherwise, he would not have entered the temple or asked God for mercy. Without faith, this tax collector wouldn't have even attempted to enter the temple, but instead lived in a state of depression over his sorrow, sorrowful spiritual condition as a sinner. As a sinner, you remember that parable also had a Pharisee who, who uh, uh, believed that he deserved everything. It was I, 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 I did it, I, I, I. He believed in his own strength, his own power, his own goodness, his own graciousness. And he was the one um, that went away without his prayer being answered. Remember, pride will totally exclude you from faith and humility. But the tax collector, understanding his sinful state, understanding that the, the God that he stood before was a good and gracious God, full of mercy. The Bible says his mercy is new every morning. And this is his mercy endures through all generations. It endures forever. He's a merciful God. Because he believed that by faith, he was able to humble himself in the state he was in, and he received salvation. He received the answer to his prayer. Amen, amen, amen. Faith produces humility. Humility. Then we have the thief on the cross. 
Luke chapter 23, 39 um, through 43. Now this man, aware of his wrongs, saying, says, this is what he said. He said, I am suffering justly. I am receiving what I deserve. He is aware that the only thing he's entitled to is his punishment. Yet, he believes Jesus to be gracious and good. He makes the request, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. He is requesting Jesus to do something for him, even amidst a low view of his importance. He perceives Jesus to be gracious and consequently promised salvation. Without faith, this man would not have asked Jesus anything, but rather grieved his own poor choices considering to die in his sins. Because remember, it was two. And both of them um, began to mark Jesus on the cross. Both of them. But the one had a change of mind when he realized that the Jesus that was on the cross was truly the Savior. And he said, let me get, let me get my request in now. I, I can't get no lower than I am now. I'm about to die. I'm about to be crucified. But I'm being crucified next to the man who could save me. Who could save me once I, 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 I am crucified that he can save my soul. So by faith he believed this and he humbled himself. And right beside Jesus, and he asked him, he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus looked at him, and he said, this day, this day you will be with me in paradise. Oh, you ever had Jesus to look at you? <laughs> Jesus. Oh, that might have, that had to have been a marvelous um, um, feeling for him. Jesus looked at him and said, today... Today you will be with me in my kingdom, in my par me in paradise. Awesome. Faith produces humility. Faith produces humility. Faith produces humility. Then we have um, Barnabas. People call him blind Barnabas. Mark um, chapter 10 verses 46 and 52 teaches us about blind Bonamaeus. This blind beggar calls out to Jesus as he passes by with the shout, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. This uh, recognition of a need for mercy reveals his low view of himself. Yet he believed just Jesus to be good and gracious. This is evident as he continues to yell all the more to Jesus, even as others tried to silence him. Bartimaeus had the faith that Jesus was good and gracious, which fueled his relentless cries. Because of this, Jesus comes to him and asks him, What do you want me to do for you? You ever had Jesus to ask you, What do you want me to do for you? He then receives his sight. Oh, without faith, my brothers and sisters, Bonamares would have sat in self-pity as Jesus passed by with the crowds, grieving his circumstance as a blind man that he could not follow after Jesus. Without faith, a low view of your own importance is not enough. Without belief in a good and gracious God, a low view of self leads only to self-pity. Hey, I need to say that again. Without faith, a low view of your own importance is not enough. Without belief in a good and gracious God, a low view of self leads only to self-pity. Say la. Say law. So let me let me back up to that false humility that I spoke of on the last segment. This is this is a a, 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 a portion of that self humility when we look at ourselves in a low estate, but then we don't look at God as being gracious, but we just looking at ourselves as being in a low state and we remain there 
it's, it, and that's a false humility. That's false humility. We see it all the time. We see people, oh yeah, that person is humble because they, they may bow their heads or they may, may you know, act like they're weak and, 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 and lowly. But that's false humility. True humility states that we view ourselves in a low place, you know, as no importance at all, but then we recognize that God is our good and gracious God to pick us up from that low place. He doesn't leave us there in that low place. A lot of people talk, talk about, oh, I'm not worthy. I, I don't deserve God's goodness. No, we did not deserve His uh, goodness. We weren't worthy. But however, because of shed blood of Jesus, that blood has made us worthy. That blood has brought us in now to the beloved. And we are worthy. We deserve it because God wants to give it to us. We have to believe that. So when we stay in that, that, that lower state, we say, oh, we're not worthy. I don't deserve nothing God gives me. Then we have to rethink our salvation. We have to wonder what, what are we walking in that uh, false humility and not in the true humil humility where we believe because we are not worthy, because we were enemies of God, but because he's a good and gracious God, he sent his only begotten son to save us and turn to him. Repent, that means to turn from your thinking and turn to God. That's true humility. Faith produces Humility. Instead of of, uh, of dwelling on how great you are, the focus is on how bad you are. False humility. So to cultivate a, a humble heart, we must be aware of our poverty before God. And when I say poverty, I'm not talking about finances. I'm not talking about finances, but I'm talking about our spiritual condition. And believe that our God longs to be gracious to those who are poor in spirit. Only these two things will produce a heart that forgets itself and obsesses over God. See that? You see that? See how that, that turns over? We, we know our low state. But then we, when we look at God, then we look at God, we end up forgetting our low estate. And we uh, look at God who has uh, the power to bring us out of that, that low estate. We begin to obsess over God, to be preoccupied with God. Being preoccupied with self, even having the deepest self abhorrence can never free us from self. I don't care how pitiful we may say we are, how pitiful we may wallow in it, we can, that is not going to free us. It's, we'll stay in bondage. We'll stay in bondage to our pitiful self. It is the revelation of God, not only by the law condemning sin, but also by His grace delivering from it that can make us humble. Amen, amen. The law may break the heart with fear. It is only grace that works that sweet humility that becomes joy to the soul as its second nature. It is the soul that finds God to be everything that is so filled with his presence. There is no place for self. Self and God can't reign in the same atmosphere. It, you will elevate yourself or you will either elevate your, your God. It's one or the other. Can't be both. Can't be both. It is the sinner basking in the full light of God's holy redeeming love. In the experience of that indwelling divine compassion of Christ. Who cannot but be humble. Not to be occupied with your sin, but to be fully occupied with God brings deliverance from self, from self. Let me sort of put a pin in this. Not to be occupied with your sin, but to be fully occupied with God 
brings deliverance from self. Have you ever heard um, a constant reminder of your sin, a constant reminder that you weren't always good, that you got uh, um, skeletons in your closet, dead bodies, and all these things, you know, a reminder of sin. When God wants us not to, he, he forgets our sins. We say God cast them as far as the east is from the west. But then we remind each other, we remind others of, of their sins. We remind them of, of, of that. But God don't want us to do that. He wants us to be fully occupied with his power to save us, with his blood, with his salvation. The fact that Jesus came from glory, God was pleased to send Jesus to, to die for something he did not do. He, he died a sinner, but he was not a sinner. But he died with our sins on him. That's pure humility. Knowing that Jesus was going to raise him from the dead and he was going to be seated at the right hand of the Father and then he would have made his enemies his footstool. Jesus believed the Father. He had faith in the Father. He humbled himself. Oh, for the joy that was set before him. He went to the cross even unto death, the Bible talks about. Humility. True humility. True is is. It comes from a true faith in God. A true faith in God. Amen. Amen. And Jesus really set the pattern of humility. He said, I set the pattern for you. That just as I did to you, you should do also. John 13 and 15. Now, the, the story surrounding this, this verse is... The, at the Last Supper, when Jesus gathered his disciples and Jesus took off his outer garment and he wrapped it around his waist and he knelt down and he washed his disciples' feet. I mean, Jesus, the Son of God, our King, our Lord, this is what he did. He humbled himself. He set the pattern for humility. That we are, to, to let us know, that I don't care how, what, what your title is, whether it's an apostle, whether it's a prophet, whether it's an evangelist, whether it's a pastor or teacher, whether, whether it's a bishop. I don't care what your title is or who you think you are, that you never get that high and mighty that you can't humble yourself to help someone else in the lowest state. He went down to wash their feet. And remember Peter said, oh no, Master, you won't wash my feet. And he said, well, if I don't wash your feet, then you have no parts of me. Humility. If there's not true humility, then guess what? You're not walking in faith. You're not walking by faith, but it's a, a false humility. When Jesus washed the feet of the apostles, it was not the first time he showed them how important humility is. As the Son of God, he showed humility before he came to earth. He said, prepare me a body and I will go for us. Jesus showed humility while on earth. Father, forgive them, for they know what know not what they do. Even on the cross, even on the cross, when they, they after they spat on him, they slapped him, they, they mocked him, they did all sorts of stuff to this man who did no wrong, that he still looked down and he said he was about to give his last um, breath. He says, Father, forgive them, for they Know not what they do. True pattern of humility. Paul wrote that while Jesus was a human, he humbled himself and became obedient as far as death. Yes, death on a tortured tree. From his childhood on, Jesus left us a pattern or an example. Humility to imitate of humility to imitate. Jesus obeyed his parents, Joseph and Mary, even though they were imperfect. This is a fine example for young ones. God will bless them for their obedience to their parents. Humility. Living with the right understanding of who God is, who I am, and who you are. In Philippians 2, 
3 uh, through 11, we are reminded of the most beautiful example of humility. Christ, one with God and King of, of everything, humbled himself. Again, he came to earth as a man. He left behind his glory and willingly lived a life of suffering, rejection, and pain. In obedience to the Father, he chose to die the most painful and humiliating way ever devised by man in his humility on the cross. They, they took all his clothes. He was stripped of his clothes. Yes, and he agreed, he agreed to go through this for us. He made a way for us to have a relationship with him once again and brought glory to God. One day, every knee will bow to our humble king and every one, every will every knee will everyone will confess he is lord in humility we need to recognize that we can't follow his example perfectly and ask god to help us having the right view of ourselves means we know we are nothing apart from god let me say that again Having the right view of ourselves means we know we are nothing apart from God. Through God, we can be forgiven and He can give us the ability to live in humility. Amen. There, when you, when you get to the revelation, the realization that there is there is. Nothing you can do. I don't care how small it is. If it's lifting your hand. There is nothing we can do without God. There is nothing about us in Him. We live, move, and have our being. We can't breathe without Him. He is our very breath. We're breathing His breath. It's not our breath. He can take it from us at any minute. Remember the, the husband and wife that um, Ananias and his wife that lied to the, to the Holy Spirit, and, and, and right then he took the breath from him and it fell dead on the spot. So there's no need in, in us thinking that we can do some things without God, but then some things we can't. No, you can't do anything without God. I don't care what it is. And if you believe that, then you're dealing with pride. And if you're dealing with pride, you need to repent. You need to ask God to forgive you and repent from that. And turn to God in humility and faith, believing that He can give you the grace to teach you how to live in humility. Humility trusts God. Humility trusts God will lead. We have to believe when we ask God to lead us that He will. Then we have to have the faith to follow Him because He will lead us. Humility trusts that God's word lights the way to victory. Bible says we are more than conquerors in Christ Jesus. Humility asks God to sustain her while she waits. Oh, patience, endurance. So let patience have her perfect work so we'll be lacking nothing, needing and lacking nothing. He's a keeper. He's a sustainer. I am a living witness. I got to the point one of my testimony, I got to the point where I was dealing with something so, so dark and so, so depressing that I got to literally onto the floor and I looked up and I said, Jesus, if you don't pick me up, up off this floor, up off this floor, I will not give, I had, I had done, that was it for me. But I believe that Jesus was able no other power, but he was able to get me up. And in seconds, I was off that floor and I was walking in peace. 